Pramila Nadasan, who is Professor of History at Barnard College. There will be a Q&A after the talk, and as we record all of our events, uh, we'd like to ask you to please wait for the microphone before you ask any questions. Our interpreters can also translate any questions um, that are asked in American Sign Language uh, for our speaker, uh, so just um, raise your hand. I want to encourage you to come back for more Wolf Humanity Center events in the future, so please take a program with you and share it with other people who are not here but who might enjoy our programs. We have a wonderful lineup of events still to come, and please also check our website for programs that didn't make it into our print uh, brochure. Our next event will be on Wednesday, 18th of March at, um, at 5 p.m. here in the Rainy Auditorium. Our next lecture, we have other things like films uh, taking place before that. And for that lecture, Arnika Furman, who is Associate Professor of Southeast Asian Studies at Cornell University, will be delivering a talk entitled, For Tomorrow, For Tonight. Thai Cinema and the Expansion of Queer Politics. Terence Surveyor, who is Assistant Professor of South Asia Studies here at Penn, will be responding to that talk before we open things up for a public conversation. And I think it's, they're both fantastic scholars, so please join us for that. I also wanted to announce that due to unforeseen circumstances, we've unfortunately had to cancel our February 26 event with Professor Rocunado Ferreira, um, teacher at the heart of slavery, so please don't show up for that event. It's not happening, and I'm sorry for that. Um, the Wolf Humanities Center program is generously sponsored by the Wolf Family Foundation, the Hershey Family Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Office of the Dean in the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, so thank you to all our uh, long-term sponsors. Thanks to the Wolf Center's wonderful staff members, our interpreters, Dr. Jamie Fisher and Penn's American Sign Language Program, the Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund, the Penn Language Center, and the Office of the Dean in the School of Arts and Sciences. Tonight's lecture is also co-sponsored by Penn's Alice Paul Center for Research on Gender, Sexuality, and Women, and we are grateful for their collaboration and support on this as well as a number of our programs. We're also grateful for the important work that this research center does at Penn. And with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Ramya Srinivasan to the stage. Thank you, Karen. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Pramila Nadesan to you. She is professor in the history department at Barnard College. She's affiliated with the American Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies programs there. She teaches, researches, and writes about race, gender, social policy, and organizing. Her most recent book, Household Workers Unite, examines how African-American domestic workers in the US strategically use storytelling to develop a political identity and through their organizing, reshaped the landscape of labor organizing. She's currently writing a biography of South African singer and activist, Miriam Makeba. Professor Nadasen is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. She serves on the scholarly advisory committee of the New York Historical Society's Center for Women's History, and she's co-chair of the National Women's Studies Association's annual conference. She has bridged academic and activist work by making her scholarship accessible to people outside the university. She has been a museum consultant, has written op-eds for newspapers and online outlets, has served as expert witness before the New York State Assembly Committee on Labor as well as the Federal Department of Labor. At the moment, she's collaborating with the Institute for Policy Studies and the National Domestic Workers Alliance on the We Dream in Black project to mobilize black domestic workers in the South. She's won numerous awards and honors for her work, most notably the Sarah Whaley Book Prize, awarded by the National Women's Studies Association, and the John Hope Franklin Book Prize, awarded by the American Studies Association. Professor Nelson. Um, thank you all for coming uh, this, after, this evening. Um, I want to start off by saying my thank yous as well uh, to Karen Redrope and the Wolf Humanities Center for inviting me. 
and the staff of the Wolf Humanity Center, many of whom I've been in touch with, and there are a lot of you, you've all played different roles, so thank you all so much for a really well-organized visit, I appreciate that. And the tech folks and the sign interpreters, uh, the sign language interpreters, um, for being here. And I also want to thank all the people who helped set up and all the people who are going to help clean up once we're gone. It is really the invisible labor that makes all other work possible. Um, the title of my talk today is Rethinking Care Work, Disaffection and the Politics of Caring. And it's a product of both my academic study as well as my political engagements since I first began to write about domestic work about 10 years ago. My most recent book, uh, Chronicles Organizing by African American Domestic Workers in the 1960s and 1970s. As I was completing that book, I was troubled by what I saw as a disconnect between scholarship by women's labor historians about domestic work, which often centered on exploitation and organizing, and more recent scholarship and public discourse about the care crisis, which seeks to exalt paid care work in the home. And this parallel and seemingly contradictory conversation kindled my interest in interrogating care work as a conceptual category. What we mean by care work, what the nature of care work is, why the drive to uplift care work, and perhaps most importantly, how do we make our claim to uplift it? Since the 1990s, the language of care has come to dominate both popular and academic conversation about, about paid domestic labor. A proliferation of care scholarship and probing theoretical interventions examine everything from the global care chain, where uh, women from poorer countries travel to wealthier countries to work, uh, to the feminist economics of care. Scholars have written about how disinvestment in the public sector, the decline of the breadwinner model, and women's growing employment rates outside the home, as well as the aging of the population, have resulted in a care crisis or a care deficit that has been filled by a growing pool of low-wage women workers, mostly women of color. Proposed solutions to this care crisis include formulating a new political ethic around care, revaluing care work, and better compensating workers. In 2000, Deborah Stone wrote a cover article for The Nation magazine uh, that made a claim for, quote, why we need a care movement. Organizers and activists have also taken up the mantle of care. The National Domestic Workers Alliance, an advocacy organization that represents private household workers, launched the Caring Across Generations campaign, which links the interests of caregivers and elder care receivers. NDWA proposes that encouraging migration from abroad, paying workers well, and giving them legal status will solve our imminent care crisis and simultaneously bring recognition and value to this occupation. The care discourse has illuminated the deepening crisis of social reproduction and offered new ways to imagine, uh, to reimagine social policy, and this is undoubtedly an important contribution. At the same time, it fails to account for how care demands are oppressive and exploitative for the worker. The laudatory discourse about care essentially transfers employers' expectations, hopes, and demands for an emotional investment onto the worker. Proponents fetishize workers' emotional labor and rely on arguments about the value of care to employers to justify higher compensation. The discourse is consistent with a neoliberal logic that evaluates people according to their productive capacities. It, shifts, it reflects a shift away from a claim for state support as a human right or workers' rights based on employment status to one premised on evaluating the kind of work performed. So service and care for middle class and upper class households become the basis for political and economic rights 
for poor and working class people. I'm going to argue that the language of care has no more place in discussions of paid domestic work than the language of affection has in studies of slavery. Of course, slave owners, like household, employee, like household employers, sometimes express fondness, care, or an emotional connection to those who work for them. This, however, did not translate into an objective characterization of the labor, and in most cases, did not reflect the sentiments of the workers. The perspective of care emanates from the positionality of the employers and, and, and erases the inequality at the heart of the occupation. At its core, paid household labor, like slavery, is shaped by power and inequality and rooted in coercion, one that straddles the line between exploitation and expropriation. It is, as Evelyn O'Connor Glenn puts it, an occupation where one is forced to care. Neither the devaluation of household labor nor their struggles to improve it are new. Immigrant and African American domestic workers have long organized for greater respect and recognition for this work, most notably by establishing a nationwide movement in the 1960s and 1970s. As a way to shed light on the politics of care, I will analyze care and emotion in this movement, comprised largely of African American women who fought for rights and respect as domestic workers. African American domestic workers in the 1970s rejected the framing of their labor as care, challenged assumptions that they were one of the family, and critiqued the emotional demands imposed on them. Their analysis was rooted in a very different understanding of the nature of domestic work, one that traced the occupation's lineage to the history of slavery. They made claims to labor rights, political inclusion and equal recognition for their labor, which they insisted was the same as all other kinds of work. Examining how these workers made sense of their occupation gives us an opportunity to rethink the politics of care and rights. In the 1960s, African American workers, household workers across the country, mobilized for pay, professionalism, and respect. In 1971, they formed the Household Technicians of America, an organization with dozens of local chapters and a membership of 25,000. The movement advocated standardization of the occupation, employment contracts that delineated rights and responsibilities, training and professionalization programs, and coverage under state and federal laws. For African American women, domestic work was rooted in the history of slavery and servitude, which dehumanized and disempowered black women, while it bolstered racial and economic privilege for white families. In the late 19th century, there was a period of racialized violence, with few job opportunities for African Americans and white romanticization of a slave past. At this moment, the mammy stereotype that cast black women as loyal servants to white families emerge to further justify black women's status as household workers. Mammy's presumed loyalty, love, and care for her employer erased her, her own agency, desire, and family ties. Domestic worker activists in the 1960s vehemently rejected the Manny caricature and sought to dislodge the culture of servitude that underpinned the occupation. As Edith Barksdale Sloan, the director of the National Committee on Household Employment, which helped organize domestic workers, proclaimed in a rousing speech before a gathering of household workers, we refuse to be your mammies, nannies, aunties, uncles, girls, handmaidens any longer. The so-called mammy was the epitome of black servitude in the white imagination. The nature of servitude is one in which the employer not only controls the products of a worker's labor, but retains complete bodily ownership, including emotional control, and for many African American women, it resonated powerfully with slavery. Carolyn Reed, a household worker activist in New York City who eventually came to lead the HTA, explained succinctly, quote, 
Household workers have not been selling their services. They have been selling their souls. Mm -hmm. Household worker activists resisted the colonization of their emotions by their employers. This did not mean, however, that they didn't enjoy their work. Many domestic workers loved their jobs and the people for whom they worked. Dorothy Bolden, who headed the National Domestic Workers Union of America in Atlanta, said in one interview, I love this work, I really love this work. Although many people loved their work, few saw it as a labor of love, or even as care work. Many of the workers I write about testified repeatedly about the emotional demands made on them, um, and how this was the most taxing part of their job. Geraldine Roberts, a household worker in Cleveland, who started an organization called the Domestic Workers of America in 1968, explained her posture of submissiveness and feigned emotion. She said, quote, we were not satisfied. We were afraid we may not have the job, that we might get fired. So we was submissive to the boss lady to some degree, as we were to our mistresses in slavery time. The fear of the employer, the fear of not being able to get another job, no references being given if she got angry. We had to pretend and smile when we didn't want to smile and show our teeth and laugh loud and act stupid to make her feel that we were quite humble to her. As Robert suggested, household labor was in part about playing the deferential mammy role and demonstrating care whether or not one experienced those emotions. It was a politics of performance that didn't reflect her inner feelings, perhaps akin to what Darlene Clark Hine called a culture of dissemblance. In the course of my research, I was fortunate to find a wonderful collection of primary source documents at Georgia State University that are part of the Dorothy Bolden collection. Bolden was a household worker who began working at the age of nine. She lived in uh, the Vine City neighborhood of Atlanta, and she knew Martin Luther King. In 1968, with King's encouragement, she formed the National Domestic Workers Union of America, which actually was neither a national organization nor was it a union. Um, hoping to revalue the occupation, Bolden initiated an annual Maid's Honor Day, as she called it, uh, in Atlanta, replete with a multi-course banquet and an award ceremony. Employers wrote letters of support, nominating their maids for Maid of the Year. And the letters illuminate the value that employers placed on the occupation and the specific qualities that they cherished in their employees. For employers, love and self-sacrifice, despite meager pay, were the hallmarks of what they believed were the ideal domestic worker. For example, uh, employer Ann Winston praised Rosie Powell, who she said, quote, swooped in like Mary Poppins and saved the family from being broken apart while accepting a very low salary. Moreover, Rosie, according to Anne, quote, sustained third degree burns of her forearm when she risked her life to put out a kitchen fire which endangered my baby. When she returned from the hospital with her arm wrapped in bandages, she insisted on serving supper to the family rather than leaving the chores to me after I had been at school all day. In 1976, Johnny Salisbury won the honor of Maid of the Year. And according to her employer, Johnny was deserving because she bathed and cared for the employer's 75-year-old mother, entertained her mother's friends for afternoon tea, took care of the dog, cleaned a 10-room house, did the laundry, tended 50 plants, cooked fabulous meals, never complained about unexpectedly having three or four guests or large numbers of extended family for dinner, and often stayed late if her employer uh, was delayed returning home. Another employer wrote that Johnny was cheerful, bright-eyed, and remarkably pleasant. Another letter writer described Johnny as unselfish and giving extra time underscoring the way the labor was perceived as caring work because refusing to give extra time may have been viewed as selfish and uncaring. The implicit or perhaps the explicit message here is that the most worthy household workers 
operated from a place of love and selflessness. The demands for care emanated from employers' concerns, hopes, and desires. Employers entrusted their home and children to another individual. And in order for that situation to be viable, they had to believe that their domestic workers were uninterested in money or even her own family, but was motivated by care and love. Many employers embraced their workers as, quote unquote, one of the family, which also reflected their emphasis um, on bonds of affection and mutual love that presumably informed their labor. When employers proudly recounted how their workers consistently chose loyalty and devotion to their employer's family over their own, they invoked the enduring nanny trope. Jewel Adams' employer referred to her as, quote, our friend and part of the family. The framework of one of the family conflated paid and unpaid labor and assumed that workers had an emotional attachment to the people for whom they worked. Carolyn's, Carolyn Reed's understanding of one of the family was quite different. In one job, Reed was referred to as one of the family, but she worked from seven in the morning until midnight. She never got a raise, never received social security, or had a vacation even after five years of employment. She had an epiphany after a particularly galling incident which exposed the fiction of familiarity and prompted a permanent change. In her words, and it's a long quote, but I'm gonna read it. She said, one night the woman of the house who had been having an affair and was very, very nervous began to scream at me for not having done something she thought I should have done. As she screamed, I realized I wasn't real to her. I mean, I wasn't a person to her. She had no respect for me, for what I did. I was a servant to her, maybe even a slave. I remember while she was screaming, I began to say, I don't work for you anymore. And that was it. I packed my bags, and in the middle of the night, my husband, who was then my boyfriend, came and got me, and we took off. This incident illustrates how proximity and distance shape the occupation of domestic work. Household workers labored in the intimate space of the home. They were privy to some of the most personal details of the family's life. They were sometimes confidants and nurturers, yet at the same time they were invisible and dehumanized. Processes made possible through racial othering, which exposed how they were anything but family. Domestic workers categorically rejected and debunked their mythological status as one of the family. <clears throat> Geraldine Roberts, who organized in Cleveland, explained, I was not in the family will, and if I got sick, I was not a part of that family anymore. Constructing domestic work in terms of care and family enabled employers to flout the law and create informal and unpredictable work situations. It became a way to mask the power dynamic in the relationship, a way for employers to insist that employees work longer hours without additional pay since family members were often expected to go above and beyond the call of duty. In this way, the politics of love and care eclipsed the labor relationship at the heart of paid domestic work and undermined the struggle for rights. In my research, I was struck by how these domestic, how for these domestic workers, care work correlated closely with the framework of one of the family and the emotional labor central to the occupation. These domestic workers never embraced the language of care and they insisted on being treated as workers with rights. Their characterization of household labor as a rights-based occupation disrupted employer narratives about love and family, so evident in the Maid of the Year nomination forms. Carolyn Reed asserted this most clearly when she said, I don't want a family, I need a job. Domestic workers mobilized to ensure labor protections and to standardize and professionalize the occupation. They sought federal legislative coverage for minimum wage, unemployment insurance, and the right to organize and bargain collectively. Both domestic and agricultural workers were left out of New Deal labor law in the 1930s because Southern congressmen wanted to maintain control over the region's black labor force 
and Northern Life labor organizers failed to prioritize the labor of African American men and women. The New Deal protected many American workers, but not all. It instituted inequalities, creating what Eileen Boris has called a racialized gendered state, hardening boundaries between those inside and outside the category of legitimate labor by privileging some workers while further marginalizing others. The labor performed by people of color and white women was deemed less valuable and accorded fewer rights than white male industrial workers. <coughs> Domestic workers campaign in the 1970s for inclusion into the Fair Labor Standards Act minimum wage provisions perhaps best illustrates their goals of equality and recognition. It was a struggle that was incubated in a historical moment when the struggle for rights predominated when activists and policymakers were optimistic about the possibility for the expansion of American democracy and the ways in which foundational inequalities could be ameliorated by, ar by arguing for the, equal rights, uh, of, for, for, for the equal rights for people who had been left out of the rights and privileges associated with citizenship. Domestic workers lobbied on behalf of the proposed amendments to the Fair Labor Standards Act they testified before Congress, and they mobilized employers to support them. Household workers' primary, primary goal was to secure the same legal protection and social standing for domestic work as was afforded to other forms of work. And Edith Barksdale Sloan, one of the middle class uh, leaders, uh, argued, quote, pay must be increased to provide a livable wage. Second, workers must receive the so-called fringe benefits, which long ago stopped being fringes in every other major American industry. Household workers made claims both on the value of the work and on the rights of the worker. Domestic work for them was not distinct from other kinds of work, but in fact was the same and should be treated the same. They rejected the history of servitude, claims of familial ties, and demands for care and love, and insisted on distance and professionalization. They did not call themselves caretakers, family members, maids, or domestics, but wanted to be known as household technicians. Mm. In this way, the domestic worker rights movement was at its core a labor struggle, centered on a fight for expanded rights and protections. As Carolyn Reed said, household workers are the last frontier of labor organizing. In 1974, with successful passage of the congressional, amend of the congressional amendments, they won federal minimum wage protection and moved one step closer to full equality. Their press release stated, minimum wage coverage for household workers gives to these one and a half million employees a legal mandate a recognition of the value of their services and basic equality with other workers. For the domestic worker, whether she is black, white, red, or brown, or lives in the east, north, south, or west, it means a new respect for her service and her person and the ability to support herself and her family. For domestic workers in the post-war period, the discourse of care and love was a holdover from the pre-modern era, when they were treated as servants and the mammy figure reigned supreme. In the context of expanding employer, uh, of expanding state protections, domestic worker activists made important strides towards winning a measure of recognition and legal rights, and shedding the paternalism that underpinned their exploitation. At the very moment when these rights and these struggles were gaining traction, however, the character of capitalism was undergoing transition, and the foundation of workers' rights and state protection built since the 1930s was being whittled away. Since that landmark decision in 1974, there has been a profound transformation in the economy. A slow and steady erosion of labor rights for all workers, a weakening of, lab of labor unions, a rise in precarious work, has made traditional forms of labor organizing less viable. There's been a shift away from manufacturing, and those in the non-goods producing sector, restaurant and fast food workers, nail salon workers, home health care aides, hotel workers, domestic workers, teachers, accountants, 
uh, now constitute close to 80% of American workers and are increasingly contingent. Mm -hmm. Many work part-time, intermittently, or as independent contractors. Because of the defunding of the regulatory apparatus, labor laws are inadequately enforced. And compounding this, the climate of fear and surveillance discourages workers from addressing workplace violations. It is in this context that the discourse of care has emerged. Perhaps because of the seeming futility of the struggle for rights under neoliberalism, scholars and advocates have turned to a moral argument about care or have framed rights in terms of care. And the intention is both to ensure that the needy are cared for and to make claims for the value of this labor. Care is an important ethic in households and families, communities, and in social movements. People often do care for and about one another, and this unacknowledged caring should be recognized and appreciated. It is the unpaid labor that so many of us engage in, caring for elderly relatives, neighbors, or children, work done out of love and often not accounted for. With the dismantling of the social safety net, state support for care work has been diminished, Create, creating what one, caller, one scholar has called a crisis in social reproduction. And the slack has been picked up by friends, family, and community. The ethic of caring that prompts friends to help a disabled friend, children to care for elderly parents, and neighbors to offer assistance is central to human survival and what makes us social beings. Yet it is also emotionally and physically taxing, and it is more important than ever that we insist on public assistance for this work, whether in the form of expanded welfare programs or workplaces that accommodate the care responsibilities of their employees. Based on my prior research about revaluing the mothering of poor African American women through expanded state support, I see an enormous benefit to accounting for the many hours of unpaid labor that people do out of love because of diminishing public support and for reframing government programs and social policy in terms of the necessary life-sustaining labor of care. Acknowledging care contributions also undercuts the individualism inherent in neoliberalism, the idea of self-regulation, self-reliance, and discipline by highlighting relations of mutual dependency. In the context of neoliberalism, where everyone is measured by their economic value, it may be beneficial to consider how we can craft a civic culture and social politics uh, I'm sorry, social policy around the politics of care with the aim of providing care for everyone who needs it. Welfare benefits for poor single parents and food stamps to the impoverished should not be dependent upon work requirements, the expectation that they must give something to demonstrate their productivity and worth. By insisting on a renewed public accountability, the discourse of care pushes back against a neoliberal trend to relieve the state of responsibility for care work. However, the framework of care that might be essential for rethinking unpaid labor cannot be superimposed onto paid household labor. Arguments about revaluing care, which I think are routinely applied to both paid and unpaid household labor, perhaps unthinkingly, um, are rooted in the long history of the exploitation and devaluation of women's unpaid labor in the home and their efforts to draw attention to this work. Socialist feminists have theorized how social reproduction, the cooking, cleaning, and caring done in the home, was essential for the functioning of capitalism. Without that labor, the current generation of workers would, not, would be unable to survive and future workers would not be reproduced. Its value, however, was rarely acknowledged. The devaluation of household labor was tied to the rise of wage labor and industrialization that separated uh, home from work and public from private in the 19th century. Although, now, uh, uh, although acknowledging and valuing this unpaid labor is imperative, 
I would argue that the paid and unpaid work of social reproduction are fundamentally different, and the dividing line is precisely the question of emotion and care. The care work that family members engage in, however burdensome and undervalued, is vastly different from paid labor. So while I might make dinner for my family, if I stop by a restaurant and pick up a meal, I don't assume that the restaurant is preparing it because they care. <laughs> while the task is the same, the nature of the relationship is not. The relationship between the worker, the work, and the recipient, I believe, is the most critical factor in analyzing the politics of care. Attributing the devaluation of paid domestic labor to gender inequality and the public-private distinction obscures the multiple ways that women of color have experienced economic exploitation. Their work has been devalued, whether it took place in the home or in institutional settings, such as schools and hospitals, where they are relegated to the lowest paid sectors. It has been devalued if they were employed in the industrial or the service sector. For the most part, uh, for most domestic workers, the devaluation of domestic work did not originate with gender inequality within the home, but rather racial inequality within the labor market. Centering the home and gender inequality also makes invisible the men, especially men of color, who historically have worked as domestic servants and the growing number of men employed in the low-wage service and care industries. The devaluation of paid household labor is better explained by the history of slavery, racism, and colonialism. The history of enslavement of African American women, the outing program that placed indigenous girls in the homes of white patrons, Puerto Rican women who served as contract laborers, Chinese men employed as domestics, undocumented household workers, and employees of foreign diplomats today are some examples of how various means of labor control, state power, and legal constraints are central to the history of contemporary status of domestic, of paid domestic labor. Domestic work, like every other occupation, is embedded in a structural power relationship which determines the nature of the work and how notions of liberation are constructed. Characterizing paid household labor as care valorizes the emotional content of the work and elides the question of labor rights. It marks a shift away from claiming rights simply because one works, regardless of the type of work, toward a focus on nurturance, emotion, and social need as a basis for inclusion in the realm of rights. So it becomes egregious that those who care for our loved ones live in abject poverty or are subject to deportation. The care discourse replaces the post-war campaigns for universal rights with a politics of justifying and allocating rights to certain people because of what they do for us or who they are. This is consistent with a productivist discourse and the neoliberal tendency to attribute value to human bodies based on differential scales of worth. The idea that one must earn human worth, which will demonstrate, which, which will determine one's access to rights, labor protections, and adequate pay. The care discourse implies that the worth of the poor and working class people of color is important to the degree that they serve and care for the middle and upper classes. The demands to properly compensate care work because of the service they provide to the elderly, disabled, and young is rooted in a privatized, market-driven model of care that privileges the needs of employers. The language of care, I think, does a disservice to broader campaigns for justice. The care discourse places worker rights upon a scaffolding of employer needs and emotional investments in the labor. In this way, it premises the collective social good on the interests of the more privileged sectors of society to ensure they are well cared for while making the needs of the less privileged contingent upon the well-being of the better off. The discourse of care is centered almost exclusively on the needs of those with some means and reinforces a racialized hierarchy. Although the discourse of care is couched in universal terms, we all need care, 
Few of the solutions adequately address the care needs of the poor. <laughs> the reality is that the poor have fewer and fewer options for caring for themselves or their loved ones. At the same time that the care discourse became mainstreamed, welfare was dismantled, carceral rates increased, the number of children in foster care skyrocketed, and middle class families increasingly turned to privatized forms of care which became more feasible precisely because of growing class and race inequality. The care discourse has made little difference in the lives of the poor. It is time to move away from care as a justification for immigration, human worth, or labor rights. Every human being should be valued, respected, and protected, and everyone deserves justice regardless of whether they care for us or about us or whether they work or not. Despite good intentions, the care discourse feeds into a particular narrative, also dominant in the immigrant rights movement, that affirms the worthiness of some individuals because their labor benefits those with power. And it has the potential to perpetuate anti-blackness, ableism, and carceral policies that propose containment or elimination of populations that are less productive and therefore disposable. The characterization of domestic work as care work masks the race and class politics of the occupation and the reality that individuals employed in private homes are workers with rights. African American household worker activists who organized in, early in, in earlier moments can offer insights about this work and its emotional component. For, the, for them, the demand to care and be part of the family was at the heart of the exploitation. The rise of neoliberalism and the ways in which service work is the engine of the new economy make it imperative that we formulate campaigns to ensure that service and household workers, and in fact all people, are equally valued and protected. And one small step to remedy this is to reject the politics of assessing human worth based on contributions and to be clear that those who labor in the home are not carers but workers. Thank you. We have time for discussion, arguments, disagreement, <laughs> all of which I love. Um, your talk covered it all. In the metropolitan section of the New York Times every Sunday, there's a big column on life on Sunday. Usually it is celebrities that are interviewed, but not necessarily. It is uh, people in the public eye. They talk about walking dogs, what they do with their children, tennis or whatever sport, brunch, just a lot of chit chat. And oh, when they go to bed on Sunday night. The reporter never, excuse me, never talks to them about nannies or who does their house cleaning. And we can say the same about Ivanka uh, Trump, Kushner, and other women who tell us how to live our lives. I have a letter ready to go to the editor and to the journalist of the New York Times to complain about the absence of such important knowledge. Why admire these people and the New York Times when they will not give credit and proper pay to the domestic workers? Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, when I started off talking about the invisible labor that even allows us to be here today, right, it happens all the time. I mean, it's, it certainly happens in the privacy of people's homes. It happens even when we're at work. You know, I teach at Barnard College, somebody who comes and cleans our bathrooms there. It's not work that I have to do. So it's around us all the time, even when we go to restaurants. There are people in the back washing dishes for us. And I think part of what we need to do is to make that labor more visible, right, uh, is to uplift that labor, is to recognize that labor. But it's true that very often when we talk about people who are individual successes, and one of my favorite is Sheryl Sandberg. <laughs> I always pick on her. She's not a terrible person. Well, okay, I'm not gonna, no judgments here. But you know, she's, she uplifts herself, and she has been uplifted as a feminist heroine. 
Marlin in some ways, right? As a symbol of sort of modern day, you know, the lean in feminism that if in fact if women just worked hard enough, if they were aggressive enough, if they prioritized properly, her message is all women can make it, women can have it all, right? And, but what is absolutely invisible in her narrative, and I have read her book, is that she and many other women in her, in her class category have an entire staff of servants who are doing their labor for them, who are taking care of the children, who are picking up the slack, who are cleaning the house. I assure you she's not going home to clean her house. Um, and so I, I think we, especially when we talk about social mobility, when we talk about personal success, how people make it, we have to talk about the kinds of support systems they have. And sometimes it's not paid labor. Sometimes it's our, my mother helped me when my child was very young. She came and she stayed with me for periods of time to help out. But that's all labor that I think we have to acknowledge, um, you know, as we talk about why we are where we are. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I don't have any disagreements with you. The one thing that I think about um, in terms of this concept of using the term care as opposed to I forgot something technician, um, just the reality of people who are looking for people to, to care for their children. I mean, obviously there's like the systemic things and bigger picture things, but what have you seen as effective on like a day-to-day -day basis and in interaction when you think about how people interact with somebody who's actually caring for their children and young kids um, in terms of wanting them to be emotional and affectionate. I think it's a very hard line to keep, and I'm thinking about my sister and uh, my nephews and the person who cares for them, and she is kind of talked about as they call her auntie and is part of the family, and she loves and cares for them in very like obvious ways. Like, How do you draw that line? Yeah, I, I don't know that we have to draw a line, right? I mean, you know, I think sometimes about the emotional labor I provide for my students. <laughs> you know, like sometimes I have students who come in who, like, need, they need me to be a caring professor. Like, I don't see that as part of my job description, but you know, whatever. I, I care, I do care about them and I want to take care of them. And so I think that, but I'm not, you know, I mean, it's, it is not part of my job description, right? But I, I, I think that the way to do it is people, we, we naturally form human connections with one another. We do care about one another. We're all social beings. I believe that fundamentally. And so even when we go to a doctor, we want a doctor who's somewhat caring, right? Who's listening to us, who is concerned if we have a pain somewhere. Um, and so I think the idea of care is not something that's isolated to someone who's taking care of our children. It's in many, many people we deal with. Even when we sh we're in the store and we shop and somebody's behind the counter and they seem a little rude to us, right? We're a little turned off by that. So I think we need to strive for, um, you know, uh, more, for better human interaction in all aspects of our lives. It's not something that only applies to household workers or to nannies. Um, and my, and I know, I, I do a lot of work with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, but also local organizations uh, around New York. And the workers, I mean, they're the best ones. They will tell you, actually, I just want to be treated like a human being. I want to be paid what I'm worth. I want to, you know, if you say I get off at 5 o'clock, I want to get off at 5 o'clock. <laughs> I want, you know, if I stay longer, I want to get paid time. Let, let's, let's have an agreement. Let's have an understanding what my rights are as a worker. And I think that's really the most important thing. Most people I know who are doing this work actually really like the work. You know, they wouldn't be doing it if they didn't like children, you know. Uh, those who don't end up doing cleaning because they don't want to be around children. So I, so I don't know that there's a necessary tension there. I think my reading of it is that feminist scholars have created this tension between love or money, and I don't think there is necessarily one any more than in any other occupation where we expect some kind of human interaction from somebody. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for the language you're using. I think it's really, really reaffirming. Um, I have a question actually about Something I'm not really familiar with entirely, but I see a lot of advertisements for them on the bus about um, become a certified nursing assistant and you can be able to be hired through your family to take care of, you know, 
other people within your family, but essentially also be getting paid through an agency. And I'm just really kind of curious what you think about that. I think that this talk has really kind of changed how I thought about that, but I'm really kind of curious um, what your take about that is. Um, I think that's a system that has worked for a lot of poor families uh, because they're doing that work anyway because they cannot afford to send an elderly parent or someone who's disabled in their family to an institution or to a center where they'll be cared for by a full-time staff. So it's other family members who often end up doing that labor um, and sometimes they have to leave a job in order to do it. And so these um, state-based programs that are, well, they're agencies that are funded by the state, I think have created an avenue for people to take care of their family members. And I personally think it's a good thing. Uh, they're not paid what they ought to get paid. I think the wages need to be higher. But, I, but overall, I, I support that. I think, I think we should all get paid for the care work that we do. Um, so I agree with this. So much of what you said, particularly the link to racial inequality and to, and to slavery and that legacy in this kind of work. But I'm aware that, in, uh, thinking about um, Perret and Fondano Zotelo's book about how, about domestic workers in Los Angeles and how they're the Latina, mainly Latina domestic workers were the ones who wanted a more warm relationship with their employers, and the employers were actually trying to create a more employer-employee relationship. And so I thought it's as if there's many different ways of claiming rights, in a way. You can claim rights through kinship, or you can claim rights as a worker, and, um, and that in some ways the, the problem of domestic work is that both of those are sort of operating. They're, to, they're from the perspective of the employer, they're disposable kin, because if they were to become kin, then they might actually get an inheritance, and there would be, mm -hmm. there would be, particularly the way inheritance is working in economic inequality these days, that kind of com um, compounding it, but that would be. Um, significant or sort of there's no way for adults to adopt each other is, is another sort of problem that we have and particularly for immigrant workers that might actually make a huge difference in terms of changing citizenship anyway it's, it's like the the employment when does the employment contract become a source of exploitation versus one by which you can claim more power and when does kinship become the mechanism by which to claim power versus exploitation anyway why that varies from one you know the, for the african-american organizing you know domestic workers organizing clearly was <clears throat> let's claim working rights and not kinship you know kinship was a source of exploitation but then in other contexts it feels a little different and i don't quite uh, anyway understand why that might be sorry for the long question right. i don't know that i would use the word kinship to refer to this occupation. Um, because there is no kinship. They're workers, they're employees, you know, and they might work for the same family, maybe for 20 or 30 years, and they might love that family dearly. I worked at Queens College for 15 years and, you know, developed a fondness for my job. Um, so, so we could be in a place and a job and really enjoy the people and the place where we're working. It's not, it's not a, a relationship of kinship, however. I think, um, so I think that the question of rights and a, a, essentially a labor contract that is uh, negotiated between two equal parties is absolutely essential, right? So we have to be really clear on what rights these workers have. What is, it, what is your wage? When do you get off? What happens when you work overtime? Are you responsible for the cooking, the cleaning, and the child care? If so, how much? There just has to be clarity about what's expected of the worker, as one would expect in any job, right? Um, so I, but on the other hand, I think that, you know, it's not to erase the human emotion that is central to every relationship we have, including the people with whom we work for. And so I think that, um, those workers that you're mentioning who sometimes wanted more of an emotional connection with their employer 
wanted a mutual emotional connection because very often the, co the emotional connection between workers and employers has been one, as Carolyn Reed's case was, of her employer expecting her to be there for her, expecting her to sort of be her confidant, to talk to her about her problems. But most employers actually know very little about, at least this was the case in the 60s, and I think it's still true to a large degree today, know very little about their employees' lives, about their children, about their hopes, their aspirations, about all sorts of things. And so it just has to be, as with any relationship, a mutual relationship where I can talk to you about my family and my kids, and you can talk to me about yours, and we can share those stories. But it's not, it, it can't be a one-way uh, relationship. Thank you. I was just thinking, if the family dog got sick, he would be sent to the veterinarian and taken care of, or possibly hospitalized. But if the domestic worker, or the uh, household technician, if you will, got sick, it would be on them to pay their bill and to get to the doctor and everything else. So that shows it right there. There's, there's a, a, a dominance relationship of the, you know, the, of the person employing the, per the, the other person. And there has to be some protection. And it, the problem is, is that uh, all workers in general are, are, as you were saying, are being whittled away because full-time work has become part-time work. Uh, one job that, that, that feeds a family and supports you into the middle class, being the lower middle class, not even the, uh, the higher echelons, is, it's really two jobs now in order to do that, maybe three. And there's uh, no such thing as pensions any longer. It's all 401k, which is really basically, you know, uh, it's it's uh, what the what the finance uh, dictates basically because the stock market could be easily drop at any time and you could have nothing as a as your age. So basically, they're talking about jobs now, but they're I, but they're, they're, nobody's ever talking about the quality of jobs. And this is the same thing with the domestic workers, the people that pick the the uh, you know work in agriculture and so on and so forth. The, and the, there's another big problem, too. <clears throat> the status of people doing these jobs, they're uh, sometimes in an econ economic strait or in an emotional strait, where they feel that that's their, their lot in life. You know, they, they don't, so they need somebody to help them organize. And that's not happening either, because the laws are against organization. People have a tendency now even to think that unions are bad. Why should I pay those dues? But anyway, that's, that's my statement that, you know, if the family dog gets sick, he'll be taken care of, but the domestic worker will not. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, most domestic workers don't have any kind of health insurance, right? And they have, if they're paying for uh, a doctor's bill, they're paying for it themselves. There are employers who are generous and do, and might, will pay a, a doctor's bill for their worker. But again, that often comes from a space of charity as opposed sure. to a place of rights. And that's the big distinction. It's not that there, there are some very good employers, okay? Very good employers, but it's not a question of, uh, being a good employer, it's a question of what, what am I entitled to. But, but your other point about uh, how this is a, a condition that a lot of workers are now experiencing, I think is a really, really important one. Because it's true, and one of the arguments I make in my book, which I didn't really talk about today, is that domestic workers, in some ways, I think, are the precursor for the kind of economy we're seeing today. They are the ones, they work, they're independent contractors, they don't have pensions, they don't have health insurance, they're not guaranteed minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. This is, these are Uber drivers today, they're gig workers today, they're all these people who are content, adjunct faculty today, right? They're experiencing the same kinds of working conditions that domestic workers have always experienced. And I, I say that not just to draw a parallel, but to, stop and to think about what we can learn from the domestic workers who organized in an earlier period. They didn't have a legal right to organize. They were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act. So they had to go outside of the framework of the law, of what the law allowed, right, and find alternative ways to organize. And I think it's really powerful, and I think we have a lot to learn from them. I want to thank you for your uh, talk and your interest in this topic. I'm very interested in 
maybe uh, want to acknowledge my own position as a, a professional caregiver, as a psychologist. So I am actually paid by the hour to care. I'm very interested. I, I just want to acknowledge that's my position in asking this question. I want, would be interested in your thoughts about this question of um, emotional work. Because everywhere I go now, and every single thing I do, I'm asked to give feedback on the quality of the service. And I, I think it's related to your uh, previous response about caregivers being the forefront of the new worker, where you're, you're I, I think of the worker on the other end of the tech support who has to hear whether me, my crazy state, when I can't figure out how to work my computer or something, and I'm giving feedback to this person, it means their livelihood about whether I think they were nice enough to me. So I'm just interested in your thoughts about that element yeah. of labor. So yes, there. Are, I, I mean, I think it has to do with the growing importance of service work in our economy overall. And so I think there is a lot of pressure, and some of the earliest studies done on emotional labor that were done were done uh, not on domestic workers, but uh, airline uh, right. uh, flight attendants. Um, and so, yes, so there's an expectation, and they're often gendered, but not always gendered, right? So they're, uh, you know, men of color who are in service occupations too, uh, that have this expectation that they are gonna treat uh, customers in a certain way. But yeah, there's, I think, a deepening emotional uh, expectation about how workers serve people. And, and I guess I'm curious about that dissimulation, you know, the, the pretending that's required, it becomes part of the job, like the airline stewardesses, I believe, mm -hmm. spoke of the stress of having to smile when you don't want to smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think don't, it's separating us from our natural feelings. It, it is, it absolutely is. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure what to say about it because I think as customers, we all, including myself, you know, like you go in and you uh, are, you know, in a restaurant, you kind of want the person to be pleasant to you, right? And so it's, it's a hard thing, and I don't know that I have an answer for that. I, I think we all ought to have, like, decent human interactions. <laughs> but does that mean I have an expectation of emotional labor on the other side? Perhaps I do. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wish I, I had some clear answer for you, but I don't. Do you? Um, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I, I do have a question. Um, so there's been some work in... Oh, hi. There you are. hi. Hi, I'm Kate. Uh, I'm an undergrad here studying philosophy and religious studies. Um, I have a question uh, coming out of some work in labor economics. So some labor economists um, sort of study why people have the number of children they do. And of course there are um, many reasons for that. Access to birth control, internal family decision making. Um, but one of, one, of the, one of the reasons that has been offered is that people have children so that their children will take care of them when they're older. Um, and I'm really curious about sort of coercion that actually goes on within families. You sort of made this distinction. Um, you said that one way to, to differentiate care work is through an analysis of relationships, um, whether they're sort of uh, formal relationships or maybe, maybe informal relationships where that sort of origin of love and care um, makes more sense and isn't coerced. But I'm really curious if any of the people you've spoken with who are formal, um, formal domestic technicians um, sort of talk about their personal experiences within their own families um, and whether they experience the same sort of patterns of coercion within relationships and, and sort of how you've navigated um, like an extension of a lot of the work you've done in formal labor markets to sort of personal relationships of care? Well, my, uh, in my conversations know. with, well, I, I, I don't know historically because these workers who I write about, I mean, one of the things that makes, makes it very difficult to write something like this is the archival record is so thin. So I was able to uh, do this research about their political work in the public sphere. I don't know a lot about their per I do know some, but I, you know, it's it's too thin to make, um, you know, to develop any kind of systematic analysis about how they interacted with their family members. I do know with Dorothy Bolden that her husband was a partner and helped take care of the kids a lot while she was off giving speeches and you know and organizing people. Um, in terms of the domestic workers I know who are organizing today, I do know that they have 
like all of us, very complicated relationships in their family. And sometimes, all of us, we you know, love taking care of a, you know, someone in our family who needs care, and sometimes we find it a burden, right? It's difficult. Sometimes, I, as I have two kids, sometimes I love taking care of them. And my, my son's friend is here, actually. <laughs> so Tyler, sometimes I love taking care of him. Sometimes it's a huge burden. Um, and sometimes he brings his friends over for dinner, too. <laughs> no, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but it's... But it's <laughs> Um, but, I, but I think with domestic workers, they have complicated family relations like all of us. And uh, I think it's harder, however, for somebody who's a domestic worker versus somebody like me with privilege, right, and resources. Um, because it's harder for them to travel places because of the lack of resources. It's harder for them to order out meals or all the things that we might do to make our lives a little easier when we have those unpaid uh, burdens of care. So, right. Thank you for your great talk. Um, I'm interested in uh, asking a follow-up question about some of these questions of uh, solidarity ac across class differences. And uh, you, you identified um, People who are, you know, for example, domestic uh, workers doing care, this kind of care work, as being, uh, you know, in a way, predictors of the types of labor patterns that follow later in other, you know. So, if we take, for example, the university, one of the things that I've seen uh, um, with, as there has been increased demand for um, a kind of care labor or emotional labor of faculty, is um, a refusal of that kind of labor and um, a disidentification with it as, as a way of kind of highlighting the way those demands are made. Um, but it doesn't seem to translate necessarily into uh, thinking about all the other places in the university where those demands are made at a different level. And things like staff recognition awards, even with the terms that are built into them, seem to pull out one set of staff members, like the criteria about like saving money or whatever, identifies the staff who work with money rather than those who don't. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm just interested if you have thought about um, what ideal models of solidarity for both kind of trickle up awareness and trickle down solidarity, like at those moments where care is demanded in places where people feel like they have the option to say no to it. Well, I. You know, I mean, I think we could talk about solidarity in our places of work, or we could talk about solidarity more broadly, and I think it should happen in both, right? So we should think about the people who work with us. Uh, and as a professor, and for the professors who are here, we have a certain kind of class privilege, right, that gives us leverage to say, I'm not going to do that. And not everybody has that option. So I think you always have to be very aware of what your own privilege is. Um, and how do you use that privilege, you know? How, how do you use that? I think it's very, I mean, for me, solidarity is about um, uplifting the voices of people who are on the front lines of organizing. It's not speaking for people. Because I think when you speak for people, you're ultimately disempowering them. And so I think it's about allowing them to speak for themselves and giving them a platform, right? So, you know, what I wanted you, I could have given you a talk that really just shared my ideas about care. And I think when you hear it from the workers themselves, it just means something very different. You know, and that's the work that I do with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, too, is to really, I do a lot of support work. I don't speak on behalf of domestic workers because I can't. So I think it's about the ways in which we create space for other voices that are not heard as much as our voices are. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was enlightening. Um, I just had a question about, in your research, your findings, um, if you found anything about uh, kind of the earlier question about agencies. I recently read the book Made by Stephanie Land, and um, I found myself, as I was reading it, um, getting so mad at the agency because, you know, if a, an employer was paying $15 an hour to this cleaning service agency, and then they would take their overhead and give her seven or eight, and, um, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking maybe these agencies provide some fringe benefits, maybe not. I'm sure they're all very different. And just how do you how do you think about that uh, relationship between 
employer, agency, and employee adding like a middleman to this? Agencies, by and large, are very exploitative. They're profit-making agencies, so they're taking a cut because they want to make money off of somebody else's labor. So generally, they don't work very well. Uh, there's organizing happening. Uh, I know in North Carolina, in Durham, North Carolina, uh, household, not household workers, home health care aides have been organizing in the agencies. It's, real, it's quite difficult because agencies will fire them. I mean, there's a lot of people available to work, so it's a, it's, it's a very difficult uh, struggle. Um, there is a woman in Madison, Wisconsin, I know, who started her own cooperative, an African-American woman who worked for agencies for a long time and said, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And so she got a bunch of her friends together and has started her own cooperative so no one is taking a cut of their labor. Um, so I, you know, I don't think it's um, it's much better. For in fact, in some ways, it's worse when people are employed for agencies because they're actually getting less money than if they were employed directly. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's. Just, I, I think we still have to continue to to uplift the job and to provide rights for those workers, which should include minimum wage, health care, time off, you know, everything that we think any worker ought to have. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. It was amazing. Uh, what do you see as the future of domestic worker organizing, given the political climate <laughs> that we're in? Thank you. Um, so most of the proposals and, that I've heard around performing domestic work right now are voluntary, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, again, it's the problem of, you know, the good employer. All the good employers are going to be a part of those programs. But we, we don't need more voluntary programs. We need to coerce those employers who are not so generous and not so kind to comply with the law and to treat their workers properly. Mm -hmm. um, the future of domestic worker organizing, um, you know, it's a, hard, it's a hard political climate in a lot of ways, but people are really kind of pissed off at Donald Trump, I think. <laughs> you know, like, I think people are energized in a certain way. It's a very, it's hard, I think, when you feel like you have the courts against you, you have the legislature against you, you have the president against you, but I think people are starting to feel like if they're angry, they just need to try to make a change, that there are no other alternatives, and I think... You know, I, I'm not sure where that will lead us. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist. I don't know why I'm an optimist. I'm always an optimist, and I think maybe it's the reading that I do of people who've organized throughout history, and that inspires me every single day. But, um, yeah, I think we have to be optimistic or else we give up, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again so much for your work. I just, a lot of memories of stories from my grandmother and her past just came up in this. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge again that the whole mammy situation and the idealizing of that is like very dangerous um, and didn't want that to go unspoken. But my question for you is, um, in acknowledging that domestic technicians are taking care of folks, um, there is that question of who is taking care of the domestic mm -hmm. worker, the domestic technician, and their families. And I was wondering, in your research, did you find any sort of, not just hope, but also structural examples of what could be transposed into the world of caretaking? So that folks who are not only in the workforce, but also employers themselves actually have like a separate network that isn't um, contingent upon really not allowing uh, the domestic technicians to actually have a life and be able to take like care of themselves mm -hmm. um, and have um, just a, a, an abundance of scarcity. So I'm not sure if through seeing how um, domestic workers like actually took care of themselves if we can envision a better future or model for how uh, caretaking can happen. Mm -hmm. mm. I think, you know, I feel it sound like a broken record, but like rights, <laughs> you know, ensuring a basic set of rights. If people are working, you know, 15 hours a day, they're not going to be able to take care of themselves or their family members. But if we, if it's an eight hour day and if you, if you get a lunch break 
and you get an afternoon break, you're paid decently, you have health insurance, it's easier to take care of yourself, right? Um, if you get adequate wages, it's easier to take care of yourself. It's impossible to take care of yourself when you're living off of $9 an hour in New York City. It's impossible. Uh, as the gentleman back there said, sometimes you're working two or three jobs. You know, So how can you take care of there, There's no time or space for that. So I think we have to ensure, and it's not only domestic workers, there's a lot of people right now, restaurant workers, nail salon workers, bus drivers, who are doing low wage service work and are not getting the rights and benefits and protections that they need in order to survive. And we're not talking about living a luxurious life, but being able to take care of themselves and their family members. Um, and that's not an adequate answer to your question, is it? No, no. I'm just, sorry. I, I can't stop thinking about how, you know, my grandparents, how folks took care of themselves amidst all this outside of familial relationships and like obligation and obviously survival. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just trying to think if there was a better structure, a better structure to apply the rights to, to create um, like care that makes sense. Well, I think ultimately we have to move away from a privatized model, right? I mean, I think if we thought about, and there were feminists in the 1970s who fought for socialized childcare, you know, spaces where, and you know, it's like, I think it's a hard job, you know, in contrast to what you said, um, you know, it's, it takes a lot of skill and knowledge to figure out how to raise children, to figure out how to clean a house to figure out how to cook. I mean, like, that's not, un we call it unskilled labor. It is not unskilled labor, okay? Um, and so why not have centers that took care of children and people who were professionals and knew what they were doing take care of children? Why not have, you know, socialized communal forms of, you know, food production? Um, we do now, but they're privatized, right? Mm -hmm. It's not available for people who need it necessarily. Um, so my long-term vision is to actually organize a different kind of society where we're not all scrambling and battling one another, uh, you know, and fighting over the crumbs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, please join me.